good morning if you are in the West Coast like I am, um, and uh, also two of the chairs of this presentation are. Good afternoon if you are joining us from the East Coast, and good evening if you are actually joining us uh, from across the ocean, Europe, or the former lands of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, my name is Baki, Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, and I'm also the convener of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association's online meetings. Uh, you all know why you are here. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that, but I I'm going to have a short presentation to just very briefly introduce the panel to you and also maybe uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our upcoming events. Uh, so. You'll be hearing a lot about digital Ottoman studies today. Um, and I should start by thanking Nuket Warluk. Nuket Warluk uh, was our journals, Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, uh, chief editor until uh, February uh, 14th, 2022. And it was her, actually who uh, commissioned this special dossier, uh, which now got published. And uh, so it is really her vision that, uh, that uh, I am grateful for, because I think the dossier, and you will hear in a little bit, uh, shows us how much is going on on uh, digital Ottoman studies. Uh, the field has already um, full of people doing so many projects you'll hear all a little about. And then I should also mention uh, the journal's current editor, Heather Ferguson, and the current uh, co-editor, David Goodman, who worked hard to bring everything together. Um, and obviously, I'm going to introduce to you the uh, co-editors of the special dossier in a minute, who worked uh, actually to bring you the dossier uh, so, uh, you know, contributions, worked with the contributors and made it possible. So there are a lot of people, uh, as you can see, whom I need to thank. And I also want to thank just um, for our financial, uh, to our financial contributors. Princeton University's Near Eastern Studies Department is start, uh, supporting the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. And then for the special dossier, uh, Stanford University's Abbasi Center and History Department uh, provided uh, support thanks to uh, one of the co-editors' work, Ali Yaiju Oldu. And uh, very much with the theme of this dossier, we also received some financial support from uh, Miletos, uh, the uh, company that brought to you Mutaferrika, which I believe is going is, is being tried in many campuses in North America, Europe, and actually Turkey as well. And then hopefully it will be available in more and more places. Um, all right, so I, I'm not going to take more time, tell you a little bit about upcoming meetings. September, we're going to host the winner of our Kekriotis Memorial Travel Grant from 2022, Elif Kefser Özer Albayrak. She'll tell us about her project. In October and November, we'll be hosting the winners, uh, co-winners of our book award, uh, Murat Metinso in October and Faisal Hussein in November. Now for today, the three co-editors of the special dossier on digital Ottoman studies that was published in the most recent issue of the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, JOTSA, uh, they are Nora Berakat. And uh, Nora Berakat is... Uh, an assistant professor in a history department at Stanford University. She is the author of the uh, recently published Bedouin Bureaucrats, as uh, many of you probably know already. And Nora uh, will tell you about, you know, how she came to this in a little bit uh, with uh, other uh, co-editors together. And then uh, Yunus Oud is... Um, an associate professor of history at Marmara University, and uh, among uh, many of his co-edited volumes, there are one can count Bir Semte Vefa and Tari Rashid Vezeli, which is a primary source. Uh, Yunus Ul is actually one of the very forerunners of digital studies in 
Turkey, Digital Ottoman Studies in Turkey, and he uh, runs a center for that uh, at Marmara University, and he has also worked a lot on urban history. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ali Yaycuoğlu, Associate Professor of History at Stanford University, whose books you very well know, uh, Partners of the Empire, uh, and then uh, his recent co-edited volume, Crafting His History, um, that it, which is a fester for Jamal Kafadar. And um, Ali Aijoğlu is somebody I know, uh, I'm not going to say how many years, because then we're going to look both very old. So we'll keep that to ourselves. Uh, and now, again, you're here for this, and I'm going to shut up so that uh, the co-editors as co-chairs can take it up from here. Okay, please go ahead. Nora, Yunus, Ali, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I will start. Um, I would like to start uh, by thanking um, Baki, Nuket, Heather, David, uh, and my co-editors, uh, colleagues, Nora and Yunus. Uh, this was an adventure we started the project i don't know like three years ago we, we uh it was in fact uh, nuket's idea at the beginning um and then nuket um left uh, as the um, editor and then heather took over and it was really very uh, productive um experience with lots of interesting moments um very cherishing i learned learned a lot so i would like to thank also all the uh, all the um uh, contributors our our great our uh, our colleagues um <clears throat> so in a, in many ways this is a continuity of what uh, amy singer uh, started in 2015 and 16 uh in the uh uh at the Institute of Advanced Study, uh, with kind of the idea was uh, bringing people uh, working on different digital projects together and create somehow kind of an awareness uh, and make also people know uh, of each other's projects and uh, and create a kind of a platform for a collective thinking. So this was the idea uh, and. Digital history is changing so fast. So by no means this volume uh, is, a, I would say, milestone, not at all. It is just a snapshot of particular moment. Uh, and uh, most of the projects already, uh, you know, I mean, they, they uh, submitted their articles <laughs> a year ago or something, and probably the projects transformed has transformed uh, since then. So uh, it's kind of odd to publish a journal, especially dossier on digital humanities as, as, as things are changing so fast. Um, but still, I think it has a value and uh, it creates a kind of, a, again, uh, a kind of an awareness and um, um, for, for Ottoman digital studies, uh, Within and uh, towards the within within the digital like historians of digital the community of the Ottoman digital studies, but also the the field the Ottoman history and digital uh, humanities in general. I would like to read some uh, lines from our introduction. Um, should just to set the you know start the discussion, and then I will turn microphone to to uh, to Yunus. Um, okay, uh, today uh, digitized and born digital archives, online resources, digital corpora uh, repositories, ebook uh, books, uh, search interfaces, digital images and sound recordings, graphics, and digital maps are integral parts of historical research and teaching. In many ways, going digital is not a choice, but a given. Over the past decade, decades, the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies uh, Association has charted multiple developments in growing fields of uh, digital Ottoman studies. Previous contribute contributions to the journal demonstrated a clear sense of optimism. 
digital methods carried the promise of broadening and uh, fundamentally reshaping quantitative, textual, and spatial analysis of the Ottoman world and transforming relation, relationships among scholars, students, ins institutions, and the public. This special issue aims to provide both an overview of the current state of the field and a platform for wider discussions about the implications of digital methods across the field of the Ottoman studies. In the research articles and notes that follow, authors present the projects and approach a range of methodological, epistemological, organizational, institutional, financial, and ethical challenges and innovations. They show that digital and computational methods have become an integral part of the Ottoman studies and gestures, gesture towards a critical field level discussions of the challenges and opportunities these methods entail. Such discuss discussions could include three broad themes that appears as, as salient uh, in Ottoman studies today. The first involves the politics, ethics, and scholarly implications of digitization in a broader scale. Digital history, digital history now covers a very wide spectrum. After years long initiatives for digitization of documents, libraries, cultural heritage, photography, film collections, uh, sound records, historical maps, and images of objects and past, the past has become digital. While there's a global co campaign to digitize historical resource, uh, sources, multiple ethical and political questions about the biases involved in deciding what to include, what to exclude, website design, sustainability, accessibility, and search interferences. Uh, uh, the massive digitization of the Ottoman archives and uh, catalogs is fundamentally changing the way we do Ottoman history. Uh, but scholars have not yet engaged in field-wide discussions of the implications of this digitization. A second priority discussion involves the way we read, uh, view, and analyze historical material, data, big data, and metadata. The heated discussions around close reading versus or with distant reading uh, in literary studies, which concerns scholars' ability to analyze large corpora with the help of the machine, both for micro and macro analysis at the same time, coincided with the development of different digital tools for data and or text mining. Perhaps the most influential development has been an enhancement of optical character recognition technology that covers images into machine readable text. As we see in various projects presented in this issue, uh, promising, the, uh, promising developments in non-Latin alphabet, uh, OCR, various text encoding initiatives, handwritten text recognition, and uh, natural language processing are particularly crucial for Ottoman text analysis, owing to the nature of our sources and the scribal, linguistic, semantic, and morphological patterns of Ottoman languages. A third priority discussion involves the way we approach historical geography, space, and place in the Ottoman uh, context. An Ottoman gazetteer, namely a geographical index or dictionary uh, for the Ottoman world, has been ongoing discussion and passion for multiple Ottoman scholars for, for some time. Earlier attempts to build a gazetteer hosted by the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton, initiated by Amy Singer in 2015 and 16, were a promising start. And this special issue includes several contributions by scholars who are active participants in this collective project. Uh, under undergrading our approach um, to digitization, text and space, further discussions about visualization, mapping and data could also follow from the special issue. Many of the contributing projects team uh, project teams uh, produce visualizations, uh, contributing a wider discussions about the promise, politics, and limitations of visualization and its implications for humanities research. Charts, graphics, uh, diagrams, or maps help us to visualize information. Visualization is a form of design employing different forms, colors, sizes, scales, textures, and orientations. Any visual representation has an artifactual and artistic quality. Visualization is therefore an interpretive rather than neutral endeavor 
one that entails various choices as we, as well as inevitable distortions, limits, and reifications of particular power structures. A critical and historical awareness towards graphical expressions used in digital research is only one of the epistemological issues that the digital historian is contributing to the special issue phase. The use of maps is another challenge. Both conventional and digital maps created a wide, uh, via different contemporary platforms such as geographical information systems or global positioning uh, systems raise pressing questions about anachronism. These platforms are embedded in various contemporary assumptions about space, scale, and geography, as well as political assumptions about boundaries, territories, and administrative units. As critical geography and cartography studies tell us, visual representations of speciality as its textual representations are not a priori given or neutral phenomena, but rather culturally contested, ideologically fashioned, and socially and politically constructed. Data mining practices and their visualization offer yet another set of epistemological challenges. As Jana, <clears throat> Joanna Drucker suggests, all data is copta, namely made, constructed, and produced often from messy resources and uh, pose complex interpreta interpreta interpretational challenges. The visual representation of data with graphical form is a second round of interpretive activity. However, data visualization often conveys the impression that data is self-evident. Scholars should develop ways of benefit uh, from data visualization while simultaneously maintaining a critical method that reminds the viewer that these are not presentations, but representations, not information, but interpretive artifacts. In sum, to conclude, Methodological transparency is crucial, but not adequate to deal with the challenges that digital methods, tools, and processes present, including visualization. A critical engagement with the very visualization process, sharing choices, shortcomings with the public, often helps us to de denaturalize and denaturalize, uh, sorry, denaturalize and de denaturalize the experience. But perhaps more importantly, an epistemological awareness in the field about visual mediation can be fostered through intellectual dialogues between designers and scholars. Digital Ottoman projects, especially those with strong commitments to the conventions of the humanities disciplines, should explore possibilities for visual expressions of ambiguities, complexities, fluidities, fluxes, and independencies with critically exposing hegemonies and power structures conditioning both our own lives and those of the historical actors we study. Thank you. Now let me uh, invite Yunus to say a few words about the project and the way that he interprets. Yeah, uh, thank you, Aidi. Uh, and welcome all of you to this very exciting occasion. Uh, I know uh, we don't have much time, so I'd like to briefly address a few, few points later in the uh, session maybe, uh, because we should discuss the nature of knowledge. Uh, as uh, Ali said, the uh, data, the meaning of uh, data and the big data. And also uh, there are many new skills we should uh, know and have. And also uh, the huge change uh, we have now in research process. And also uh, we should uh, rediscuss the uh, sharing of our studies uh, and uh, studying with the uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the very next uh, very future. Therefore, um, I think QA session is uh, very, uh, will be very good uh, to that tonight. But now uh, it is truly delightful to see the emergence of a, such a special dossier in Ottoman studies. Uh, as Ali said, uh, following the uh, lead of individuals, teams, and platforms, such as uh, I remember the Professor Ramazan Ajun studies from Hacettepe University and Professor Emi Singer from especially Otom Open Ottoman Initiative. And, uh, Digital Ottoman Studies platform uh, 
maybe you know uh, we uh, set up it uh, two years ago and i hope that this work will further enhance the interest and discussions in this field uh, therefore crowning the previous efforts we now have a much more comprehensive textual dossier for us but uh, just uh, an attention uh, as you are aware and uh, mentioned before there are more research notes in this issue compared to the research articles uh, i interpret this as a sign that we will witness uh, a more substantial contribution of digital studies to autumn historiography in the coming years uh, maybe uh, we can discuss it uh, in the uh, end and i have two thanks uh, thank you again for joining us this evening and i would like to thank the editors in chief of the journal those editors authors and reviewers and uh, i think uh, all we have accomplished a pioneering work. Thank you uh, again. And uh, now I think Nora will continue. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to my co-editors. Thank you to the journal editors and to JASA in particular. Thank you to Baki for all of this organization. Um, I have like one slide of things to say. I'm having trouble um, advancing the slides, which does not bode well. So I apologize for that in advance, but here we go. Um, basically, we started out, as you know, many of you with a CFP for this issue. Um, we had been having some discussions about between some of the people who submitted research articles, and then we moved on to a CFP, especially for the research notes. And I think what makes, you know, what's what's interesting about that is just that we did produce um, through the special dossier a uh, kind of overview of where this field is at, digital Ottoman studies, which Eunice and others have already been way into um, with their, their projects. Um, and so a few particular fields um, really emerged uh, within the special dossier fields of interest that I just wrote down here. OCR, HTR, automated transliteration. Ali also um, spoke about this. Digital archiving, editing and enrichment, visualization and analysis of networks and relationships, and historical space and spatial analysis. And these are all the things you're going to be hearing about um, from our presenters in about 30 seconds. I also just wanted to emphasize the challenges that we saw coming out of many of these projects as the co-editors kind of looking at them as a group. Um, there are ongoing pro um, challenges that I hope we can talk about in the Q&A about defining relationships with proprietary and commercially driven products. Um, we remain in a very Anglophone computational environment, which poses particular challenges to many of the teams involved in this project. Um, and then also uh, just the challenges of collaborating within and across institutions, um, especially this brings up all sorts of structural inequalities, some of which we tried to discuss in the introduction. Um, and then as Ali was was elaborating, um, just our, our attempt to maintain and expand critical approaches, right, to digital Ottoman studies in particular, um, especially to how we think about visualization, how we think about data. So these are all the, um, some of the issues that I hope we can get to in the Q&A. We have 14 um, short lightning style presentations of um, the research notes and research articles in the special issue. I'm gonna pass it now to um, Supan Kermis Alton, who's gonna be our first presenter. Um, Supan, when you're finished, if you could pass it to the next person in the order so that we can save time. And please, to all the presenters, I didn't mention this in our pre-meeting, please tell me when you'd like me to advance the slides. Um, so now I'll pass it to Supan, and thanks again to everybody for coming and to the my co-editors and the journal. Okay, thank you, Nora. And good evening, um, good morning, or good afternoon to everyone. I'm Supan Kırmızatın. I'm teaching Middle Eastern History at New York University Abu Dhabi, and I'm here to represent the Digital Ottoman Corporate Team. Before I start, I'd like to thank the editors for assembling this important and timely volume and Baki Bay for organizing this event. Uh, today, I'm happy to introduce our recently launched initiative, the Ottoman Turkish Crowdsourcing Project, or OTURK. And I would like to also say a few quick words about our focus on creating a robust uh, digital research infrastructure for Ottoman studies. 
and the role crowdsourcing might play in this agenda. So at uh, Digital Ottoman Corpora, uh, our research, the main focus of our research program is uh, digital text and infrastructure creation for Ottoman studies. And we are driven by two primary objectives. First of all, we would like to help to unlock the vast Ottoman historical archive for distant reading methods, such as uh, textual analysis and data visualization. Secondly, we would like to strengthen the presence of Ottoman studies within the textual digital humanities. And we believe that crowdsourcing the digital transcription of Ottoman Turkish is fundamental to realizing these objectives. Moreover, we see crowdsourced knowledge production as a pivotal step in not only building a DH research infrastructure for Ottoman studies, but also in democratizing access to the rich Ottoman cultural heritage for both scholars, but also for, for the wider public. And to realize this vision, uh, at least part of it, uh, we built a volunteer-generated transcription environment for Ottoman Turkish with Zooniverse which is the world's largest crowdsourcing platform. Our choice of Zooniverse as a platform stems from our commitment to open and collaborative scholarship and research. And while our primary audience are Turkish speaking citizen scientists and scholars, Zooniverse does provide a conduit to engage a wider audience, hopefully helping to cult um, cultivate a community centered on shared knowledge production. Beyond transcription, Oturk also has an educational purpose. Uh, purpose. It uh, offers a platform for students and enthusiasts to refine their paleographical skills, immersing themselves in primary documents and historical texts in a digital setting. Um, while we are excited about the potential of this project, we are also aware of the challenges, for example, um, rallying a dedicated volunteer, com volunteer community, especially given the specialized nature of the language, is a significant and non-trivial task. Uh, additionally, ensuring consistent transcription standards across a diverse set of volunteers does require uh, detailed guidance and carefully prepared resources. Um, however, with the power and allowances of the Zooniverse platform and our commitment to collaborative research, we are optimistic about uh, navigating these challenges. In, in wrapping up, uh, the Otur project represents a fresh digital approach to autonomous studies by leveraging crowdsourcing and building a dedicated community around it. We aim to make significant strides in the field enhancing accessibility, fostering education, and promoting collaborative research. As we embark on this journey, we are really eager to see the insights and connections crowdsourcing uh, will foster. Um, I thank you for your, for your attention, and I think I will pass the digital mic to Aysu Akjan now. Hi, everyone, and I'm grateful to be part of this event, also the, the special issue, and I'm also thankful for all the, uh, the people who are involved in this event and special issue too. And yeah, as you can see, we are a, a, a crowded team and I'm a representative of uh, this, this large team and my name is Aysu Akcan, and I am from the University of Vienna. I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, I'm working on late 15th and early 16th centuries Ottoman literary culture, but today I am here to present you totally different kind of topics. And yeah, as you can see, uh, the Akis project, as the title of the research note also suggests, uh, aims to develop AI-based software and web application for the automated transcription of Ottoman Turkish texts. Um, it's... Um, so we have another tool, which is transcripts. Maybe today also the other uh, the group of people talks about this kind of uh, another um, like AI-based transcription uh, tools. I would like to just make a comparison between Akis and Transcribus to just uh, give you a hint about what the difference between these two uh, software. So uh, if uh, anyone ask uh, what's the difference between Akis and Transcribus? Uh, the main and most important difference between these two software 
uh, it uh, based on the the ready to use models. Um, we use ready to use models uh, without the looping any. Uh, in transcripts, you have to use uh, you have to create your own individual models to transcribe your Ottoman text. But in Akis, we aim to create a ready to use models to um, uh, to um, to serve our users, let's say. And moreover, Akis aims to develop larger data sets over time and to become a software that can automatically transcribe in quotation mark all uh, Ottoman Turkish texts, including different writing styles, typographies, different document types, periods, and genres. Of course, this aim should include the acceptance that Akis will give the expected scale and satisfactory results uh, in the coming years, if it's fed by a large and big amount of uh, data. Uh, now, I would like to ask, uh, no, like, uh, Nora to just uh, run and play the just short video, if it's um, possible. If it's not, then maybe I can also share my own screen. Um, is this the slide with the video? Yeah, this one. There's... Yeah, I'll let you share your screen, Ice, too, because I don't have a, um, I don't, it's not running. Yeah, just I am ready to share, you know, in any case. So. So, yeah, uh, could, you, could you please again share the, the PowerPoint for me, Nora? Okay, thank you. And yeah, um, now what I would like to state is that um, it can be easily seen that Aki's current reading accuracy is not satisfactory. So I think it's useful to mention the stages of the project and where we are now. Uh, the first stage of the project, which started in November 2022, were dedicated to making Aki's learn how to read Ottoman Turkish text and building the software interface. So to speak, the video is depiction of this period. Uh, I like to note that our that data set was around 100 uh, words during the research note was written uh, and when the first model was trained. And the second stage goal is to make Akis read all the text printed with Nesih typography between 1840 to 1928. And now Akis is being trained with a data set that is close to a 1 million words, which is an important because we all always need a large data sets. And also our only concern is not only to teach Akis how to read, uh, but also to ensure that the texts are correctly transcribed and or Latinized. 
What I mean by Latinize is that uh, we are working on standards which is created by consultation of the experts of 1840 to 1928 periods, such as Engin Kılıç and Fatih Altu. Uh, moreover, we also work on full transcription standards. Datasets are being prepared based on the standards of Encyclopedia of Islam. And uh, all in all, ACIS is being also trained on these two different standards too. And finally, in the third stage of the two years project, the aim is that ACIS will be able to read all texts printed in Nesih typography from 1730 to 1928. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, I can say that the most important challenge that ACIS and we faced is that in such software is expected to read all texts with perfect results. Uh, but it's not an easy task. Uh, I would like to conclude by adding that uh, this project, which we wish to spread over many years, is like a marathon and that it should be realized as follows. Uh, ACIS will progress by increasing the pace from time to time, what I mean um, when it's getting funded, and uh, the lowering the pace uh, from time to time, uh, the, what I mean in, 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 with this, uh, like lowering the pace period, is investi investigating the funding uh, opportunities. And it's important to note that even in the walking pace of the project, artificial intelligence has the potential to learn faster than human beings if it's given the right and sufficient data sets. And now I would like to move to the other, other uh, project that I'm a part of, which is uh, the digital uh, preservation, publishing an HDR of Armenian Turkish manuscripts, printed books, and newspaper from the Mehitarist congregation in Vienna. I would like to start with, as it is stated in the research note, the Mehitar project will be the first comprehensive investigation into a large corpus of Armenian Turkish manuscripts. The next slide, please, by the way, Armenian Turkish manuscripts, prints, and newspapers produced between the 18th and the early 20th centuries and located in the Library of Mehitarist Congregation in Vienna. The collection in Vienna consists of more than 2,600 manuscripts, 150,000 books, and the world's largest collection of Armenian newspapers and periodicals. And for this project, a variety of disciplines and methods will be brought together, and one of them will be the DH. Um, there are three main, the next slide, please. Uh, there are three main phases of the Mehitarist project that are related to the field of DH. Uh, the first phase is digital preservation methods, which we are not specialized because digital preservation methods use various technologies and scientific process, such as microscopy, imagining, IR and Raman spectroscopy. These methods will be run by the labs and the centers where the manuscripts and printed materials preservations are the main concerns. Briefly, in the second phase of the project, the cataloging will be done through TEI header and the other metadata tagging schemes. Next and the last phase will be based on the two utilized transcribals. If each of the texts in the Mehitarist congregation had been transcribed, would have directly transferred to the text to the machine readable format with TEI. But at this point, considering that none of the texts are transcribed, we focused on automatic transcription in transcribus, where we can also export the transcribed text as a TEI based machine readable format. The Armenian Turkish model developed in transcribus is based on printed text between 18th and 19th centuries. As you can see on the other slide, um, uh, transcribus is currently trained with a data set of uh, 122,000 words, can read this text with a result of uh, 0 0.4 CER. The CER means uh, the, the transcribus can read approximately 99 characters out of uh, 99, not, uh, 9, 000, uh, 999, 9, I'm just sorry, I'm not good at mathematics, but uh, like if it's like a, a 4%, then transcribus can read 96 uh, characters correctly, 
and like the four character uh, incorrectly, let's say. So sorry for the wording, by the way. And yeah, um, also the transcription standards of the uh, developed model were created by Hülya Çelik and Anisa Gassan, who are also with us today. And this is all from my side. I just would like to just give you a brief information about both Mehitaris project and the Akis projects. And I would like to invite Stefan Kutz uh, right now to the team. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, does, I, I don't have, I didn't send any slide in, uh, which I'm terribly sorry for. Uh, okay. But I'll share the link to our project in a second if I find the right window. Um, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So this is here. Um, yeah, I'm uh, here to represent uh, the Quad project that the Institute for Habsburg and Bottle Studies at the Aust Austrian Academy of Sciences, also based in Vienna. And our project is working on a digital scholarly edition of Habsburg Ottoman diplomatic sources. Uh, the, the data that we already have online is published on, on the qhod.net, and I just uh, sent you the link uh, in the chat. Our research team is editing the remaining sources of high-level diplomacy between the courts in Vienna and in Istanbul. Um, Manuela Maya is the colleague who is responsible for the mostly German language sources. She's also editing some Latin and uh, Italian French uh, letters, for instance. And Yasse Vilmas, on the other hand, is editing the Ottoman documents. In addition to textual sources from the archives in Istanbul and from the Haushof und Staatsarchiv in Vienna, which also house substantial amounts of Ottoman sources, we also collect metadata about remaining artifacts, such as, uh, for instance, gifts exchanged between the two courts. As numerous archival sources have been preserved over time, we are now focusing on the records that uh, deal with brand embassies which are uh, about 10 to 15 mutual diplomatic exchanges that were carried out mostly in relation to important peace treaties. Our project only started in 2020, and we are currently finalizing the first uh, of those uh, grand embassies, namely the exchange of uh, Damian Hugo von Viermont on the Habsburg side and uh, Ibrahim Pasha um, on the Ottoman side from uh, 1719 to 1720, that is after the peace of Pasarovitz, Pozharovac. Um, for our editing, we use XML markup uh, in the TI flavor, uh, like, like the project that I just mentioned. Uh, this allows us to prepare a critical edition using a standard vocabulary of tag names uh, and for linking between the documents and uh, to our standard database of named entities. Places and persons and institutions are referenced and the prosopographical details uh, are collected in a, in a standard database that we uh, invented for that purpose. The TI data is versioned using, using the Git uh, versioning system, and then uh, it is displayed on the web using XSLT and standard web technologies. Uh, we collaborate with the Graz University uh, in, for doing that. Um, they have their system called GAMS, uh, and they, um, they do the hosting for us. We do license all the, all the data under a CC BY license, so all the texts are uh, fully shareable and reusable, uh, with exception of the image data that we um, acquired uh, from, the, from the archives. For data input, we also uh, uh, experimented with Transcribus, uh, which was previously mentioned. Um, so far, we only uh, actively used it in uh, for printed sources in, in German, uh, partially also for handwritten sources in, in German and Latin. 
where Josh Priebus, uh has error rates below 5%. So this is really um, a, a great time saver. As soon as Yasser and, and, and his new project that will be uh, starting in September, um, it's about the grant visa rate. Uh, as soon as they start editing Ottoman uh, sources using Transcribus, we will uh, we already agreed with others that we uh, we will share the the transcriptions as as ground truth for for Transcribus based uh, HDR to uh, to make that better. Yeah, uh, challenge wise, uh, we are dealing with uh, quite a large number of documents. And it's not always easy to decide which of those are worth a full in-depth transcription and edition. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Yasser has also been working on translations of the Ottoman Turkish documents into English. Uh, needless to say that it's, uh, we, we uh, underestimated the time that, uh, that was needed uh, to do proper translations that would fit uh, our own uh, high quality standards, so to say. One more uh, challenge that I, I, I would also like to mention is the, is the translation of our web interface. Currently, it's only in German, uh, but we are in the process uh, of uh, translating that. And I, I sent you a link to the preview uh, version as well, uh, where at least the, the menu for the, for the overarching project description page is uh, already translated into English. And we're also working on a, on a Turkish uh, translation. Yeah, uh, any any questions and comments, uh, corrections even are very welcome as we are publishing uh, work in progress. And uh, if you happen to, uh, to have any collections of diplomatic uh, sources that somehow fit, uh, would fit into our uh, infrastructure, uh, just get in touch um, and also tell your friends about it if, if you know, uh, hear about somebody uh, who is working with uh, such documents. We can uh, work together, collaborate to, to make that uh, publicly available together. Okay, uh, thanks. And uh, with this, I will uh, hand it on to Erdem Idil. Thank you. Uh Hi everyone, I'm Erdem, a fifth year uh, PhD student at the University of Toronto and I'll be presenting our project on behalf of my team. I also would like to thank everyone who made this issue and this meeting possible. Um, so our project aims to shed light on the transimperial nature of Mediterranean diplomatic chancery production by considering the multiple entanglements between Ottoman and Venetian genres textual artifacts, practices, and practitioners in early modern Istanbul. It is part of the Dragoman Renaissance research platform, which facilitates research into the personal and professional trajectories and textual practices of Dragomans employed by the Venetian Violet in the Ottoman capital. Next slide, please. Uh, our main goal is to explore how canonical genres of diplomacy and of statecraft more generally were not simply the culmination of singular uninterrupted textual and evidential traditions, whether Ottoman or Italian. Rather, we ask how such genres formed out of specific circulatory regimes that connected various practitioners, dragomans, secretaries, scribes, each of whom embodied diverse modalities of knowledge production and who inhabited distinct rhetorical communities. Our data primarily comes from a particular archival phone known as Carte Turke. This phone, part of the Bailo Constantinopolis series, is today housed in the Venetian State Archives, but created, uh, but was created and continuously elaborated in the Venetian Bailet in Istanbul from 1589 to 1785. It consists of a series of 40 bound registers containing roughly 2,000 copies of Sultanic orders and other records issued by the Imperial Divan that are matched with facing Italian translations. Our current workflow involves atomizing concepts, documents, archival artifacts, images that represent these artifacts, persons and agencies represented in these documents or responsible for their production and terms used to describe these. Next slide, please. 
Defining these information concepts as separate and unique, yet interrelated in plural and shifting configurations underpins the process of link, creating linked data. The technical infrastructure for structuring, authoring, and querying data and their interrelationship is developed using the open source software Islandora, which allows for collaborative creation and editing of data entities. Next slide. One arm of the project aims to account for variation in how specific terms were deployed, translated, glossed, commensurated, or understood to stand in a specific relationship with other terms across the Kartituke corpus. For instance, utilizing Python to run new queries through our dataset has provided valuable information, contributing to better understanding of the relationships that emerge between artifacts, textual records, and practitioners. By keeping track of such instances in which interrelationships between genre honorific agency terms appear in primary and secondary texts, we intend to investigate this term's range, frequency, and shifting context of use. To enhance our data model and to produce new metadata, we, we have also been working on an ontology, an explicit form of specific, specification of the relationships among Venetian and Ottoman terms for chancery genres as found in the Karteturke corpus. This ontology will serve as a heuristic tool for examining how the commentary embedded in the Karteturke's shifting techniques of translation aligns with the broader circulatory regimes of Ottoman Venetian diplomacy. However, creating linked data is a painstaking process, requiring that we determine an appropriate spectrum of interrelationships that, al that allows information concepts to operate as unique and discrete entities. Next slide, please. Over the year, we, we had some issues with off-the-shelf proprietary software that may provide short-term solutions, but is not necessarily well integrated into the software ecosystem of shared library resources or developed with scholarly needs in mind or committed to long-term sustainability. Another pressure is that of labor in a university environment, which varies substantially from that in private industry. In reality, digital humanities labor in the institution means grappling with hierarchies of status and balancing specific needs, timeframes, and requisite skill set with the needs, priorities, and skill sets of students and colleagues. This is perhaps the greatest challenge our project has faced and we'll be happy to elaborate on it during Q&A. Thank you. Um, and I think Mervetek Gula will take it from here. Hi. I also want to start by thanking everyone for, <laughs> for, this, for the amazing work that they put through for making the special issue possible. Today, I'll be talking to you about our project with Adrian Zakhar from University of Toronto, Cistern, geographical knowledge in the Ottoman world. And I want to be very brief. Uh, there, are like, there were two goals when we started this project. One of our goals was rethinking the ways in which we categorize geographical knowledge in the Ottoman world and beyond, and also think through the pedagogical implications of our work. And by that, I mean how we as Ottomanists in North American institutions, this project started when we were both at Stanford. Adrian was doing a postdoc at SHC, and I'm doing my PhD. And uh, how we can, um, and I forgot that I did not introduce myself. I am a for a rising fifth year PhD candidate in history and a master's student in the symbolic systems at Stanford. Um, and we wanted to think through how we in the North American institutions can relate to uh, undergraduate students that come to our classes and our like research labs. How can we like engage them further, even if they're not like coming with the linguistic skills that like are very well thought through in, in academic research in Ottoman and Middle Eastern studies. And we started our database uh, building off of a Sunolo's edited volume, History of Geographical Literature during the Ottoman period. And the database that you, well, the, the screenshot that you see in there is not the final format, but, um, and then in the, in the piece that I've written, I explained the details of how we've extracted data to build this database and what kind of like editing work that went into it. I'm happy to take questions about that later if anybody has technical questions about using um, methods of text extraction from um, especially regular expressions from uh, printed materials in, the, in modern Turkish. We are currently expanding the database by additional research and especially the focus this summer is on Armenian and Hebrew manuscripts. With the support of University of Toronto, Adrian was um, able to hire student researchers to work in these archives. And 
I want to emphasize one thing, though, but what like our change of focus and what database building is actually contributing to to the larger field of digital audience studies. And the shift in this focus allows us to move from big name authors and their works. And I would like to remind everyone, like in Sun Olu's work, it is very author based. You know, and, and it's a chronological work. And then you have like one author, like a brief story of his life, and then the works that he has written that contribute to geographical literature. We wanted to move beyond that to allow uh, to, to emphasize the, the work itself, the artifacts themselves, and the manuscripts, and then the manuscripts with their like different print editions, uh, with their different copies, and then print works with their different print editions, to allow for new dimensions and relations and connections to appear between the historical artifacts. One of our big questions was uh, the lack of non-Muslim geographers in this corpus, in this candidate volume. And we, we think that it ties to the preservation and categorization of available works, and less so to like whether or not they were actual geographers in this period, non-Muslim geographers in this period, because that can't be the, the case. Um, but we wanted, we've conceptualized the, their, the lack of their presence as a silence and also as an incomplete erasure. And the reason for the incompleteness is that even a small change in the way we present the contents, the same sort of like work, the same authors, actually allowed us to discover mm -hmm. new relations. And for example, I, I don't think I have a slide for this, but for example, when we um, when we uh, when we um, building a database enabled us to um, sort based on printers, for example, and build build networks based on printers. And when we shifted the focus to printing houses instead of the, the authors, we realized that there are uh, Armenian printing houses, and we, this would allow us to explore further and then see what kinds of impact their presence as printers, as typesetters, as people who impacted the production of these of these materials, changed the, the geographical knowledge in the Ottoman Empire itself. And I want to briefly move to the second aspect of like working with students. And I've, I want to emphasize this uh, strongly because I, as a uh, rising scholar, I have this feeling that the at institutions like Stanford, there's a lot of demand from the undergraduates to work and engage with our research. But we should like, we are still like trying to build ways in which we can engage them and the ways in which we can incorporate their knowledge and their expertise into our research, even though they don't, they might not have the language skills. So when we were uh, funded by a Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis at Stanford, we had one research intern, Umar Patel, who was um, in his second year of undergraduate in uh, computer science and archaeology. And Umar was really interested in the field. He has a personal, has personal family ties. And he wanted, but he didn't have any, like, he didn't speak any language other than English. And then instead of seeing this as something negative, we actually realized that, like, what, what, what happens when we just stop thinking about, like, oh, like, this person doesn't read the language, so we can't send them to the archive or, like, whatever. And instead move on, like, hey, this is how we can actually work with them. And Umar came with an amazing skill set of um, virtual reality. And he actually continues this research right now. Like, he's working at a lab at Stanford building for the um, Apple's new uh, VR, AR glasses. And he had this idea that, like, what if we build a three-dimensional exhibition space, a virtual exhibition space in which we can present some of these works because we don't have the physical copies sometimes, well, oftentimes, and then we don't really get to bring all of these things together because even if there are manuscripts available or print works available, there are different institutions. What we could do is harness the power of the digital and actually shift the focus into presenting these works in a different way that would allow us to curate the way in which they're presented and then emphasize the relations that we're getting out of our database. Mm -hmm. And it would make them more accessible to a wider audience who can essentially enter this, enter this space on their computers. So this is still, this is ongoing work. I have not really addressed this part of the research all that much in the, in the article, but I wanted to sort of highlight this here in the presentation. And um, yeah, we hope to like share it with you once it actually becomes fully developed, but it's been going for three years and it's a very difficult and extensive project as others in this call have worked with um, virtual reality can attest. So, thank you. And I think I'm passing it on to Gilhan Balsai. Uh, hello everybody. And uh, thank you for organizing this event. So I will also speak uh, in the name of my team, Gizan Fidan, Cihangir Gündoğdu, Murat Gülenç and Murat Kilek. 
So compared to uh, the presentations uh, up till this point, we work with a more specific source. We work with two Ottoman registers of death produced in 1838 and 1839. Uh, could you please pass the next slide? Thank you. Yes, uh, that is the first register, uh, the Book of the Diseased Muslims. Uh, and uh, this is the register from Istanbul and contains almost 200 and uh, 500 uh, deaths. And the next register is uh, produced at the same time and it has 7,500 deaths uh, over 22 months period. And together both registers have uh, almost 10,000 single cases of death from Istanbul. Uh, can you also pass to the next slide, which we can see better? So the uh, registers have almost like have an Excel table format, tabular format. Uh, each row contains a single entry. And then we have uh, the date of death, the place where the death has taken place, the reputation, name, ethnicity uh, of the deceased person. The cause of that, uh, the name of the doctor who report, or the name of the person who reported that, the name of the physician who prepared that record, and the name of the physician's assistant. Uh, so, what can we learn from these? And since the data was kind of massive, over uh, 10,000 deaths, we thought that rather than uh, standard statistical uh, analysis, we should go forward with digital methods. And also the data is very rich. So we figured out that there can be possibilities by uh, using uh, digital methods. Anyway, yeah, and these uh, registers are of course, important for understanding mortality and morbidity in early 19th century. But also they uh, provide us a relationship between the urban topography and also diseases in Istanbul, or it, they present us in urban topography of health in a way. Uh, and especially the reputation category uh, provides us all kinds of information. First of all, it provides us the uh, information about uh, the sex of the deceased person. And we have an idea, we can get an idea about uh, uh, the age of the deceased person at the same time. So, uh, which means that much before Ottoman state had produced population registers and started counting pop population of uh, female subjects, it started to count the deaths of the female subjects. So in that way, yani, uh, I just give a brief idea here. Uh, the data in the reputation column is very thick and uh, can provide otherwise unavailable data. So how did we work? Uh, we preferred spectrum clustering method, uh, which we think is more relevant for historical data. So it is an unsupervised data mining procedure, and it doesn't make any prior assumptions on input data. In that way, it, it facilitates the detection of uh, local contingencies and specificities. And also, since uh, it works through mutually shared attributes, uh, and therefore it produces a comparatively be better representation of cases. Uh, our uh, that spectral clustering method provided eight different clusters to us uh, in the end, uh, which, uh, as I said, had uh, shared attributes, shared characteristics. Uh, so, what were the challenges uh, of working that way? So, geographical coding was our first step in map mapping data in registers, but uh, selecting the correct base map was a challenge uh, because back in 1980, uh, sorry, 1838, there were no street names and the boundaries of the neighborhood uh, districts have radically changed. So locating the uh, that locations of that on Istanbul map was a big challenge for us. We had to work with very different maps. And then a second major challenge was how to code the illnesses. Uh, because since the registers were produced uh, 
in the middle of a radically different medical paradigm, the humoral understanding of me medicine rather than modern understanding of the medicine, the causes of that uh, do not fit to our uh, modern understanding in a way. Uh, although the term modern has shortcomings as well. But to give an example, cough, for example, uh, appears as a major cause of that. While uh, today, uh, cough is not uh, considered a cause of that itself, but it is uh, related to at least 20 uh, other reasons of uh, 20 other diseases. There are also uh, non-medical uh, illnesses listed in the register, such as evil eye, nazar, or fate, kader, or ejel. So that was also difficult to code them. Uh, we've had to come up with uh, not, uh, and we had to avoid historical uh, codings. So these are briefly challenges. So what we find until now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and this is kind of uh, ironical, but one of our first findings is that uh, spectral clustering ring showed us that our data is reliable. Uh, so I think that was very important because the cluster clusters produced were highly consistent with our historical knowledge or what we already know. So it was in a way assuring to see that those registers are reliable historical sources and we can continue with them. Uh, to give an idea about some of the other findings, for example, Tatavla, Tarlabaşı, Hasköy, Fener, Yedikule and Samatya neighborhoods were associated with uh, Istanbul's Greek communities. And then our cluster, for example, uh, come up with uh, distinctly high number of cases uh, of uh, Greek deaths in that cases. The name of the physicians and uh, informants were also kind of uh, compatible with that. But uh, go more into the uh, diseases or uh, health uh, topography. For example, that's caused by infectious diseases such as smallpox, tuberculosis, measles, for example. There were no uh, vaccines in 1830s and uh, more than 50% of uh, deaths caused by contagious diseases were listed as uh, these diseases. Uh, anyway, maybe that's a short presentation, but I just wanted to give you an idea about that. And if there are any other questions, we can continue later. Thank you very much. And I will pass the space to Antonia Hajikiriaku. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and on my behalf, I want to thank the organizers again and the editors for their for their hard work and the opportunity they've given us to to communicate our work i'll be i'll try to be very very short uh, in the interest of time given that we have so many uh, presentations so i'll be presenting two projects the first one is the uh, economy environment and landscape in the cypriot long uh, a collective project funded by the sylvia ioannou foundation uh, and hosted at harokopio university uh, in Athens, the main idea behind the project was to identify the relationship between environment, economy, and people by uh, looking into Ottoman surveys, Tahrir de Ferleri, or uh, subsequent property surveys. There's a, a property survey from 1832. Uh, so we wanted to see the changes that can be uh, identified in, in the landscape, in, the, in, the, in, in land use, uh, in economic activity, uh, in how natural resources are being employed. And in order to do that, we also used a British, uh, the first modern British map of Cyprus, um, a trigonometrical map. Uh, uh, a survey that was conducted by Lord Kitchener. Uh, and what you see here is, is the, the uh, address of the website and the, the portal where you can see the various dimensions. Uh, I'll just show a couple of, uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, we will see, for example, the Kitchener map uh, where you can uh, actually highlight some of the attributes of the map. Uh, such as hydrology, such as land use, 
such as you know, different kinds of religious buildings, settlements, marshes, all kinds of uh, information that's contained in the map and it's probably currently uh, not available, but by georeferencing this map, we are able to identify the geographic um, coordinates. So we correlated all the data that we collected from this map uh, to see in the in the next slide to see how we can if we can move to the next slide please to see how, how we can um, use um, uh, that information and correlate it with Ottoman surveys uh, the 1572 survey of Cyprus the Tahrir Defteri um, was analyzed in a previous project so we already had the data. Uh, in the, for the purposes of the 1832-33 survey, uh, we had to create a large database with multiple challenges, uh, both from the vantage point of programming uh, and, and how to uh, manifest the different kinds of relationships between people. We had 25,000 individuals, uh, some of which are, are um, uh, we have the uh, family relations between them, or we may have shares to different kinds of property. Uh, we have multiple kinds of properties, which we classified into four big categories, uh, lands, trees, buildings, and um, animals. Uh, and having collected and analyzed um, that, uh, that data with the help of our data entry team, uh, in the next slide, we will see how we are uh, able to visualize uh, data from a particular variable, in this case, uh, wheat uh, from the 1572 um, survey, uh, and different ways of visualizing data to both understand uh, different spatial relationships uh, with reference to wheat production, for example, um, but also to generate new research questions out of the trends and patterns that emerge. So um, if we can see the next slide, please. Um, no, no, that was the end of it. So we, we, have, we have different ways of visualizing uh, data from the survey. Uh, here we can compare uh, similar um, economic activities uh, although they are uh, presented differently in the surveys, uh, in the in the in the Tahrir uh, uh, survey, of course, it's um, production. In the property survey, it's actually cultivation and land use. But by by mapping the data, we can see the spatial distribution and therefore make meaningful comparison in between different points in time. And what this allowed us to use is. Uh, overall is to compare the larger picture of the trends and patterns in the relationship between environment, economy, and people in Cyprus with the ones of the Mediterranean at large. And the one rather unexpected finding that we had, which was rather astonishing, is that all the major uh, processes that we encounter in the Mediterranean such as the movement of people from um, valleys, from, from lowlands to highlands, such as the 17th century crisis, such as the Little Ice Age, um, such as the shifts and changes in economic production. Uh, all of them are very clearly reflected and very accurately reflected in the case of Cyprus. This is not to say that everywhere we would expect to find something like this, but it is a rather astonishing uh, conclusion. In the next uh, project, which we will see in the next slide, uh, it's another collaborative project um, that uh, I am um, uh, co-coordinating with Ali uh, Yajioglu, and it's hosted at Stanford University. Um, we are looking at uh, Tebedel and Lee Ali Pasha, uh, and, the, and the key research question, the foundation uh, of the project is trying to understand the relations of power behind uh, the order that Tebedel and Ali Pasha 
um, established. And in order to do that, we are working with two different kinds of sources. The first one is a very rare uh, kind of source in, in Ottoman history, which uh, is uh, his own personal archive compiled in Greek, uh, in, a, in a blend of, 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 of based in Greek, but you have, uh, you have Ottoman, you have Albanian, you have Vlach, you have French, Italian words uh, into the different texts. So we have different kinds of petitions, for example, addressed to um, Ali Pasha. So organizing um, this archive was a huge, uh, it was a huge challenge. We had the help of the National um, Hellenic Research Foundation, uh, which had published um, the uh, in uh, critical editions of of this uh, documentation, um, and uh, we tried to see uh, first of all what kind of a geography we're looking at in the uh, in the next slide we will see uh, the area that was under uh, Ali Pasha's uh, control or sphere of influence uh, whereas very basic kinds of visualizations in the next slide uh, we see uh, the back and forth of correspondence uh, between different places um, which can give us an idea a rather descriptive idea, but still a useful one as to the distribution and density of different kinds of networks. And networks is something that we are very, very interested in. Uh, in the next slide, um, we can uh, see one of the categories of uh, documentation that we've established, which are complaints. So we can see again the, the spatial distribution uh, of complaints in different parts of the areas under uh, Ali Pasha's uh, influence. Uh, and this work uh, does not only concern, of course, the Greek archive. What we wanted to do was to correlate it and, and to compare it with what is available in the Ottoman archive, because indeed the Greek archive provided the foundation of the Muhallefat de Ferleri that the Ottomans had compiled. So we wanted to see how all this information, how all this data is being processed by the Ottoman state uh, itself. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, before we do that, uh, another, another important dimension for the project uh, are the relationships between people. Um, what we did here, uh, we, we took the index uh, and the kinds of relationships that are mentioned between different individuals and different kinds of documents. We, we saw the connections of, of individuals mentioned in the same document. So we were able to have this kind of a visualization, which is primarily a heuristic tool to identify individuals which we may not have assumed or known their importance or role in the network of, of Tebedel and Lipasha, and then we can go on uh, and study them in, in more detail. If we can go on to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, here we see the, the Muhallefat de Fenleri. Uh, the data is being processed by Fatma and Jel. Um, and uh, here we see the different kinds of debts uh, accrued uh, or, or uh, that, that were ultimate for which uh, Tebedel and Ali Pasha uh, had ultimately a claim to directly or indirectly. We have very different kinds of relationships, different kinds of financial uh, relationships, which we have tried to categorize. And again, spatially speaking, we see a very interesting pattern here uh, with the north-south uh, axis in uh, northern uh, Albania and um, northwestern um, Greece. Uh, and then the next slide, please. So yes, this is, this is the end of it then. Um, the, the major challenge that we had uh, was bringing these two kinds of sources into dialogue, of course, 
because they're using different languages, uh, different ways of I am calling and, and identifying individuals. Uh, and we are, uh, there's a lot of manual work taking place here. We cannot automate um, everything. Uh, but what we really are learning from, from this uh, exercise is the importance uh, of geography and relationships and how through mapping, we can produce new questions, uh, not just answers, but also uh, new questions and new stimuli uh, for our research. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions later. I apologize. I'm just going to intervene for a, a half a minute. Uh, I'm looking at my time, and I think after the in original introductions of the co-editors, almost an hour passed. Uh, out of the 14 presentations, we finished seven. Um, so if the other seven take as much, they're going to be really, really, really late. Uh, we also want to have some time for Q&A. So for the next seven presentations, if we could keep to three to five minute limit, that'd be wonderful. One, so that the many people who are here watching can have a chance to raise questions. Okay, please go ahead. Richard uh, yes. McClary is next. Thanks, yeah. Richard. That's great. Thank you. Yes, uh, my project is, is much smaller and therefore I can keep it much briefer. So worry not, Becky, I will, I'll get through it. Um, I haven't got any slides, but the, the images the relating to it are in the, in the article. I just wanted to thank everyone for, for being here and, and it's great to be involved. Um, I'm not an autumnist, so I have to fear I'm, I'm, I'm on thin ice, but I'll do my best. Um, our project that has run jointly with uh, Patricia Blessing now at Stanford, although she was at uh, Princeton, is to reconstruct digitally um, building in Konya, which was documented in the Ottoman era. So it's Ottoman era photographs, uh, some drawings and accounts, um, Matrici's painting of it, um, that are really what we're working with. So it's a much smaller scale, but it is using digital material in a slightly different way. Um, I mean, one might argue it's, in a way, it's quite, it's using new tools to do an old fashioned job of trying to get a traditional result. Um, maybe a hundred years ago, people would have just done a watercolor painting of the, of the reconstruction where we're using digital artists, but we are hoping to do a 3D digital model as well. Um, a lot of the material from this building was dispersed. It's largely lost. There's a little stump left with a rather, um, well, one can judge the aesthetics of what's been built on top of it, but that's a whole other subject. It has been rebuilt uh, with a steel frame over it. But um, there is material in a lot of different museums around the world. Uh, some of them are in Turkey. Others have been uh, quite clearly looted and, and acquired under dubious circumstances and are now largely in Germany, although there's some in Paris and, uh, and also some in New York and, and London as well, the usual suspects, one might think. Um, um, I have to thank Matilda Grimaldi, who's the digital artist we've been working with, and uh, Fatih Tahan, who's a Princeton PhD, who's done a huge amount of work organizing the data set and building the database and trying to make sense of all the material we've had. Um, in terms of challenges, the, uh, the lack of any coherent uh, archive to use for it is the biggest problem. And the advantage is there's a huge amount of material digitized, but it's not in a central repository. So we're sort of trawling around all sorts of different websites, as well as going to physical archives to find photographs. I think the earliest is Salakian's one from the uh, 1880, 1890, uh, and they run right through to the, uh, the 19, uh, early 20th century when it mostly collapsed. So it's a very important building. It's the only surviving, uh, certainly documented Seljuk era palace. Uh, of, of any in any region really, but it also has a lot of Ottoman era interventions, uh, some of which were documented by French scholars in the 19th century. So we're trying to understand not just what it might have looked like when it was built, but the various iterations and modifications that it experienced over the course of its life prior to its collapse in the early 20th century. Um, I think they're the main points, really. I, say, I don't want to say a huge amount about it that, that is, isn't in the, in the article. And just to really credit uh, Patricia Blessing with driving forward a lot of the project and certainly being involved with, uh, with JOSTA and, um, and also to the British Academy and the British Institute at Ankara for funding this project. Uh, so I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions about it, but in the uh, sense of time running out and there being a, lo a lot of projects to cover that are far more complex than, uh, than this one, um, I'll, I'll hand over to Burjak uh, Özlidil uh, right now, if that's okay. 
Okay, hello everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. I don't know if you can see it. Perfect. Let me just do one little thing here. I have multiple screens giving me a hard time. Okay, still good? Perfect. Okay, uh, yes, my name is Burcek Özdil. I'm at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and uh, I want to thank to the editors and organizers like everyone else. Uh, what a great pleasure to be here. So the project I will talk about today is part of my larger work on Ottoman psychiatric institutions that developed gradually between 1830 and 1930. And the case study, the Toptaşı Asylum was transformed from Atikvali, the imperial complex, the Külliye, into the state asylum of the empire during this time. Now, this is not a unique example. There are others like, you know, Suleimani and Haseki Imperial Hospitals were also used as, you know, similarly again during this time. And by all, no, by no means insignificant, they are by Mimar Sinan. Yet we know so little about them. This is a little bit about the fact that these were adapted asylums, so not purpose-built, and they were not well-documented. So here on the screen, you can see a compares, quick comparison between a purpose-built asylum and the one that we're dealing with in the Ottoman context in terms of documentation and evidence as understanding what's going on. So it really was these uh, were these methodological challenges and not well documented nature of the histories of Ottoman asylums that called for digital methods in my case. And so all these buildings still exist, yet we know very little about their lives as mental hospitals. So if you see, if you look at the image on the right top, you could have coffee in this courtyard, which is in the Fatih Sultan Mehmet Vakıf University and may never know it is the exact same courtyard that female patient used just until 100 years ago, as you see, like on the right bottom. So here we see the phases of this transformation from an unused imperial structure even during that time in the 1870s to a functioning mental institution uh, by the end of its life as an asylum. So, uh, oh. so let me mention that, you know, uh, different from many DH projects, but similar to the previous project that deal with lots of data, I had very little and scattered data. So that was one of my biggest challenges. So using digital methods meant for me making the most out of those <clears throat> by being methodologically creative. <clears throat> and in this sense, we developed Spacio Scholar as an open source. Çok yes. affedersiniz, e, you didn't move the slides, so uh, I think people, somebody wrote, uh, could be asked to move the slide to see the image. We are. Oh, I, I have been, I have been moving them, but it's, you're not seeing it. No, we see simulating spaces of madness, the Ottoman experience, the main oh. slide. Oh, that's, I'm, uh, why is not moving? Because I see it moving on my end. Nora, do you have these slides as well? I do. Borchak was sharing herself because she wanted to show a video, but I think we really don't have time. So maybe I should yeah, switch to mine. Uh, uh, Burçak Hocam, would you mind just turning it off and uh, Nora can show the slides? Sure. Um, I, my apologies for it. I think it's something with the display settings. Let me get out. It's okay. And uh, so what do you see now? We now see... Four images. Uh, uh, on okay. The okay. So, so if you don't mind, I can continue from there instead of switching. I think it okay. was the. Yeah. Okay. This is exactly where I was, I think, and so I will continue from that, which is weird, but it is. It is what it is. So we did this, and I was just talking about this. Uh, the solution, which is space to scholars and open source solution available for other researchers and scholars with similar needs. And uh, it is, uh, this is a project created in Unity, 
<clears throat> and like Veda, as a best practice, you know, it combines uh, this, the solution package combines uh, different components within Unity, but they are produced outside of it. Okay. So I started reconstructing the process of medicalization and modernization of asylums by putting together, like I said, bits and pieces of in information spread across different indirect primary sources. And then through the close reading, uh, we can learn a lot about uh, not only the history of psychiatry <clears throat> or the history of these significant ar architectural structures, but also about Ottoman modernization. Okay. Here we are walking through the asylum. I'm going to go to the next. This is how everything comes together within the, within the back end, if you uh, like with the data. And, uh, and so, in fact, it acts like a spatial database. So the components, primary documents, metadata, and information are linked through this, this space. And this brings me to the uh, to my last point. That's functionality that I want to talk about. And that is populating the empty asylum space uh, in an attempt to understand uh, experiences of asylum inhabitants, which we know very, very little about. For this, we are using an agent-based modeling framework and simulating asylum routines. And so here we're, we're seeing a short segment uh, that is the morning routine of patients, caretakers, and physicians. And uh, then, you know, based on this, we can start imagining what that they may have looked like in the asylum, opening a small window into the really you know, otherwise lost lives of asylum inhabitants. So one of the early decisions uh, I made and we made as a team was to conceive this of, of this as a solution, but not as a project. So what that means is like other scholars, researchers with similar needs can use the platform using the same um, solution package. It is available for, for using uh, on GitHub. And uh, again, for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump to the very end and uh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna acknowledge my team and funding that they made this project possible because the you know, digital humanities projects, as you all very well know, typically require collaborative and teamwork and some funding. So thank you for listening. Go ahead, Tyler. Um, next, yeah. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Kin. I'm going to try to keep this short. I have a timer in front of me. Um, I'm an assistant professor of history at Central Connecticut State University, um, and I'm the co creator of the Hodge Trail uh, simulation. Um, so, one of the things um, that sort of the sort of, of where the Hodge Trail come, came from and sort of what it is was it sort of started off with the research question of sort of after sort of my research on the early modern 17th century Hejaz and pilgrimage narratives is how do you sort of what medium is best for presenting students and teaching with stories of mobility as a means to engage in with the social and cultural history of the early modern Ottoman Empire. Through that, uh, we created the simulation or game uh, or educational game uh, through the platform uh, known as Twine. You can find it at twinery.org. I'll drop a link after all of this. Um, which is a sort of a user-friendly digital storytelling tool to create interactive text-based stories through simple HTML coding. So you can go to the next slide here. Um, so the Hodge Trail is browser-based. Uh, it's free online. Uh, you can just find it on the website, hodgetrail.com, free to play and text-centered historical simulation, sort of in a choose-your-own-adventure type of genre um, with the goal to introduce students specifically to the cultural and social history of the 17th century Ottoman world with this sort of Hodge and the Hodge journey as a through line to introduce different topics to students that play through the simulation. Um, the whole idea around this is essentially that choice-based 
interaction in games uh, has shown through many research studies uh, to further student uh, retention of information. And so it's a different way to engage students um, in the history of the early modern Ottoman world. Um, with the uh, sort of, you can see sort of the diagram on the left-hand side, sort of taking sort of historical, core historical information. In this case, on the left, you can see the travel itinerary of Yusuf Rumi, an early 18th century pilgrim from Sarajevo to Mecca, which all the routes and hours of travel in the simulation are based on along the main route. Transferring that into the program Twine, sort of to create digital stories and story mapping, which then will create through that, through the coding, through Twine, a playable interactive story that you can see on the very bottom there, sort of the, the final project of this. Um, the whole idea essentially uh, behind this is that for research purposes, so beyond the sort of the educational purposes of how this sort of reshaped us sort of doing this project, reshaped my own research thinking and my own research on the early modern Hajaz, was that, was thinking about the role of time and distance in the experience of the Hajj journey. While in my standard research, when reading early modern pilgrimage narratives and travel accounts, you often focus, as the pilgrims do, on the big places, Aleppo, Damascus, Istanbul, Konya, the big sites along the way. However, when you're coding this, and then also when you're playing this, you spend so much time and you realize in these itineraries, pilgrims spent so much time in these, quote, sort of places in between, these small caravanserais, you know, 10 hours travel from the next one, from the next one, from the next one, until you get to the next major place. And you realize very quickly, which is obviously obvious to many people, but it reshaped my own thinking of research and uh, about the early modern, about early modern travels that while the sources will focus heavily on these sort of large urban spaces of the Ottoman world, the amount of time pilgrims spent in these small places in between was the majority of their time on the road to Mecca or on their travels across the Ottoman world. And so for the coding of the project of the of the simulation or game, I you know every single location has an historical quote from some traveler that went to these places at that time, which was for 300 plus locations was a immense <laughs> task on my part. And finding and digging up sort of information about some of these caravans or stops, which you know once the caravans left, there some of them don't even have villages or cities in those locations anymore. Is trying to sort of recreate these rural spaces of the Ottoman world in a digital format for students to engage with um, and sort of what stories you can tell with those spaces. So reading pilgrimage narratives or Evliya Chelebi or other sort of travel narratives to sort of provide students with an introduction to the stories that were told in uh, the cultural world of, of the 17th century or early 18th century Ottoman world and sort of finding different stories you can tell um, both in rural and urban Ottoman spaces. Um, the whole idea around sort of one of the key elements of why a game or simulation is important for telling these types of stories is that in a game or a simulation, the developer, the designer is able to play with the element of time in a way that a text has a difficult time doing. Uh, if you assign a student a primary source, there's a way in which they, um, there's a way in which they, uh, you know, can read through a page really quickly, but if you have them spend two hours going through the journey to get to a location, even in the sort of condensed part of a time of playing in a simulation, there's a way in which they're engaging with that material, engaging with the space and location of the Ottoman world in a fundamentally different way than assigning on the text. Um, I can talk about challenges and other things later on. I'm at my five minute mark, so I will move on, but if you have any questions of the QAA, um, I will be happy to answer any of them. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Will Hanley from Florida State University. Um, I've been interested in the problem of federating data for many years, and this uh, project actually got its start at the um, the Digital Ottoman workshop that uh, was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, this session, organized by by Amy Singer back in 2015. So, um, the the solution to federating data that I uh, use in OTGAS. It has various names, graph data, link data, semantic web. And the most well-known example of uh, the approach that I'm using here is Wikidata. Please advance the slide. Nora, thanks. Um, the model uses authority, the w Wikidata model and Wikibase in general, which is the software on which this runs, uses authority files with unique identifiers um, as a platform to link and federate data. And there are three parts to 
uh, the way that these that information is structured here. There is a set of labels and aliases that you see here on Wikidata for, for Alexandria, so various versions of names in various languages. Next slide, please. There are statements um, about the about the item that we're talking about. So Alexandria is a municipality and it's located in Roman Egypt and the Alexandria governorate and all this sort of thing. Next slide. And then items are linked to external identifiers of various kinds. So you can see that um, this is where the federation of data really happens, that, uh, th that this item is uh, a hub connecting um, the way that uh, Alexandria is described in all of these other authorities. Um, next slide, please. So um, Ottoman data is an ideal domain for the problem of federation because our records are, are compartmentalized, they're um, difficult, they're multilingual, they're often sparse and contradictory. Um, the microdata approach, which is described nicely by uh, Gruber in uh, in the the in the the issue that we're talking about, um, requires a strong data infrastructure, um, and that's what uh, Otgaz provides for uh, for place names. Unlike most of the projects in this issue, there's no primary research in uh, in Otgaz. Um, it's infrastructural. Um, and all of the analysis is meta-analysis. Um, and so the initial work that I did was to transform the information in uh, Tahir Sezen's Osmanla Yer Adlara into three types, into regions like Sanjaks and Kazas, into uh, seats of these regions, and into a hierarchy, um, a location within uh, the administration of the Ottoman Empire. So Kaz uh, Kazas fit in Sanjaks, Sanjaks in uh, Ayalets, that sort of thing. Um, that work of transforming transforming Sezen is largely complete, and I've begun to link places to uh, to Wikidata, to uh, Nishanyan's map, and uh, starting yesterday into the incredible gazetteer of Erdem and Gregor, which uh, which they'll talk about next. Um, advance the slide, please. Um, so here's uh, the example of Alexandria, and um, I'm indicating uh, where Sezen says it's located in the type of status that, that the region had. Um, so the objectives of the project, um, it's meant to record details accurately, um, like name variants, geolocation, and the changing status of places over time. Um, next slide, please. And here's a map of the places that I've geolocated so far um, in, this, uh, in this hub. Um, a second objective is to provide uh, disambiguation of places. There are so many Yanijes in the um, in the Ottoman Empire, and this is meant to provide a unique uh, identifier for for each of them, a way of of producing those. And the last thing that I aim to do is uh, aggregate analysis. Um, this is really the transformative part, and Sparkle, which is the query language for the semantic web, is an incredibly powerful way of of doing this uh, doing this sort of thing. Um, advance one slide. Um, so this is the count of uh, the number of Sanjaks over time in the Ottoman Empire, which uh, I describe in, in the research note. Um, one more slide. Uh, and this is um, a query that I that I did uh, of um, the seats, uh, the Sanjak seats in each uh, vilayet in the year 1700, according to the data in uh, in Otgaz at present. Now the res results are not entirely accurate, um, but this is a, a tool as much as it is a data set, and it's ready for your attention and corrections. It works equally well in English, Turkish, Arabic, and French, with more languages to come. Um, and all of the edits that are made are recorded and attributable, and changes are available instantly and are reflected in query results. Uh, so if you see a mistake here already, you can go ahead and fix it, uh, and the query will look better uh, already. Thanks, uh, and um, I look forward to communicating with you about this. Uh, and I'm going to pass on to Erdem. Thank you, Will. Uh, thanks again. And I think uh, our project is very well, con very much connected. Thanks you that you mentioned that. And it's a really good order that we are talking. First, um, thanks, of course. Um, first of all, um, to Nuket 
uh, I was not involved in that process, but I'm really glad that she has started the ball rolling. And then to the editors, Ali in, in Nora and Yunus in alphabetical order, and um, they that they invited us. But um, if it's all right, I hope it's okay. I also would like to start with a friendly collegial critique. Uh, all of us, I mean, not 91 people online here now, but all of us who were involved in this project from day one um, knew that uh, the initial plan was a little bit different. And I won't really stress this uh, because it's important. Um, Ali just mentioned in his uh, introductory remarks that this is not a milestone, and it is very much so because this, the field didn't go the mile. So I have the impression that this is a very important project. And uh, the initial aim, if you remember, was to recruit um, experts in digital humanities, geospatial sciences, and historical GIS to referee the journal articles. And that did not happen. And that is OK. But we should be clear about this so that this work can be improved. And it's an itinerary process, iterative process. And I do want to really mention that Nora has worked incredibly for this project. I mean, from our point of view, we were only in contact with Nora and Nora has done her best. And David is not here. I think I've just checked his name. And David also worked very hard at the last stages for editing the volume. But uh, we as a group, I'm now talking, of course, in person as Erden about doing the critique, but the work that we've included in this uh, valuable volume is a co-authored work. Uh, Grigor um, Akinsefer and Pete Gerritz were part of this, but we personally just felt that it would have been wonderful if we had an editing process involving experts in digital humanities or the population geography of the Ottoman Empire. I'm not complaining, please don't get me wrong. I mean, we as a group publish also in several venues in different disciplines, but this is an important marker of developments coming from the digital side to our field. But we should just name it. And I think the Nora, Ali, Yunus can also reflect on this. Now we know more where we stand, what has to be done. But I think the original aim to get a review process from experts going beyond the field didn't work that well, probably. I mean, we haven't had it any, and we had good lists of possible interviewers and that didn't work, but this is not something that I'm blaming the editors at all. I think at the end of the day, we've done the right thing. You've done the right thing, because most probably, if we had recruited well-equipped and um, experts in their fields, most probably they would have rejected our article. So. I mean, I can easily say that uh, our work was probably not solid enough to go through a proper peer review. But in general, I think now we know where we stand and probably we know where we can go towards. But this is also a snapshot, like um, Ali just said. But just let's be aware of this. So I mean, we shouldn't really in the field say, that, oh, now we are, we've got a Spatial issue in digital humanities or digital Ottoman studies. No, I think this volume shows equally also the stuff that we lack. And I just want to say this and I want to thank again Nora because Nora, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you have been working not only on our piece, and there are more than um, three research articles, and I don't want to name the number of the research notes. Most appreciated. Um, uh, Erdem, I'm going to say something here for a minute. Uh, because neither Heather nor David are here, uh, I am working with Heather and David in the journal uh, because when Heather took it on, she already has two other journals she's responsible for. As I said, until my presidency ends, I'll help you. So in that capacity, I was actually part of editorial meetings on this question. And we did try to reach out to uh, people in digital humanities, we received names uh, and then we worked to reach out to them to get reviews done of uh, the research articles. The research notes were not meant to be reviewed, they were just to be edited, but the research articles, uh, we, we couldn't get our best shots. Uh, the 
there was, I'm, I'm not quite sure why, maybe these people who do digital humanities and are not in Ottoman studies, when they look at our journal's name, they thought this is not their cup of tea. I'm not quite sure, but we actually did try to reach several names that were passed down to us as uh, well-known experts in digital humanities, and they just uh, didn't review them. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't move. That also, I should say, be partially related to the uh, COVID era slowness. Uh, in general, reviews are coming back very late. People are not having enough time to do things. So in, there is a general lack of sort of response to review requests overall. But uh, we had a more concentrated version of uh, lack of response to the reviews from digital humanities people who have nothing to do with Ottoman studies. Uh, they just didn't get back to us. So that is part of the reason. Anyway, I'm going to shut up now so yes, that you can, can talk I, about your project. Thanks for this explanation. Can I just jump in to say we have 10 minutes left and we have three more presentations that have, people have prepared. So if we could move to those, Adam, if you have, um, if you want to talk for a couple of minutes about the project. Sure. I think I've thanked already enough because that you were our reviewer. Uh, all right. Then very quickly, I'll just uh, in three minutes summarize what we've tried to do and also follow Nora's suggested questions. Uh, first and foremost, the population geography of Ottoman Empire in the mid 19th century is understudied, and we need a gazette. It has been mentioned, Amy was here, probably she's already here, but I do not need to repeat the need for a gazette here. And the beauty of our project, we think, is that it's a collaborative effort. One fourth of this work is coming from Grigor's Marie Curie project, and two thirds of the points in our gazette is coming from Urban Occupations, OTR project, it has been mentioned in the volume. And uh, our second question, the method, the method was historical GIS, uh, and, and we've just created a customized data entry template. And third, the achievements. We do think that we've mapped something which hasn't been mapped until now, because um, like Gülhan also mentioned, Ottoman Empire starts to create uh, maps that we can use in spatial humanities, only starting from the late 19th century. Could I have the next slide, please? So it is technically possible if you can assign also uh, population data to populated places, population then stored the Ottoman Empire for the first time in on the Sanjak level. There should be mistakes in it. I'll mention it in two minutes uh, because it's the general challenge of the digital humanities, if you ask me. But this is the very first um, Sanjak based population density map of the Ottoman Empire. As we all know, there is this theory. Population density is higher in the Balkans, lower in the Anatolia, but how much higher in the Balkans, how much lower in Anatolia, we don't know. It's anybody's guess. But now we've got a population density map, uh, which can help us. And since we also geotag the population data, including the ethno-confessional relationships, next slide, please. It's technically also possible to map the ratio of non-Muslims in the Ottoman territories in the 19th century for the very first time on the Sanjak level. This hasn't been included in the uh, article, but I think this can be done. Uh, and lastly, as an achievement or let's say output, we can also bring in the environmental variables. So Ali's um, last piece on Ottoman uh, montology also worked on the ruggedness of the Ottoman Empire, but in his study, there is no population connection to that. So it is a rugged territory. Now we know more thanks to his work. But in our case, we've also now, it's technically possible for us to juxtapose population densities with the ruggedness. So these are the average slopes, but you can also bring any environmental variable. So that's the beauty of geospatial humanities, if you ask me. And the very last thing, four point challenges. Um, we have an illusion of precision in digital humanities. And that is a challenge. I think we should be aware of it, this because mathematical and computational methods create precise results. But if we feed these methods with not suitable data sets, then we reach exact solution numbers like this one, you know, population density in Huda Vendiger is this to that decimal point, but that's an illusion of precision. Historians in us should always be 
waking up the digital humanity persons working in the field. So we should be always grounded in the sources and the literature that this field has been producing until now. Thank you very much for your time. And the next person is... Hi. Here you go. Um, great, thank you. Um, so I will, I'm Camille. Um, I am an assistant professor at Illinois State. Um, I'll try to be really quick. I actually have to run in a, immediately after this, um, but I'm presenting on uh, an art, the, the article that I wrote together with Nora, David, and um, one of their former students, Neda. And so if you have any questions, you can always ask Nora or you can email me. Um, okay, so uh, starting with the, the research questions and the data we used to investigate it. So the article is about kind of two sets of research questions, one about Ottoman imperial practices around tribes and population, and the other around imperial sovereignty and inter-imperial relations. And basically one of the things we're trying to do in the article is understand these two sets of things as related. Um, and so kind of more specifically, the questions that we asked were, how did Ottoman officials conceptualize the relationship between landscapes and human population, especially among communities they understood as mobile? Um, and how did these ideas intersect with their notions of the boundaries and substance of Ottoman sovereignty in Iraq and Arabia? What does Ottoman data tell us about the production of imperial territory and population in this period, especially in comparison to the more commonly used British data? Um, and so we started with uh, a map, the map that you see on screen. Um, this is an Ottoman military map. It was produced by the 6th Army based in Baghdad in 1913. Uh, this map is in the Nader Esselet um at Istanbul University. And as far as we know, it's a, it's a unique source. So in addition um, to the map itself, it has a table of data about the tribes. And so the map is a map of quote unquote tribal territories. It's the territories of the winter grazing grounds of all of the groups living. Um, in Iraq. Uh, and so basically we read this source alongside several other Ottoman and British sources, particularly a chronicle from uh, 1860s Baghdad, Salnames from 1890s Basra, and um, Lorimer's Gazetteer was a monumental British source from the early 20th century. Um, these sources have different purposes and different formats, but all of them deal with tribes, population, and other things about tribes um, in list or table form that is relatively easy to make into quote unquote data that can then be analyzed using digital tools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's another, uh, okay, this is not exactly what I wanted, but um, I, I probably put the slides in the wrong order, my bad. Um, so this is one of the other sources, this is a Salma in my table of tribes. Um, uh, and so basically what we did is we used QGIS, Google Sheets, and Recogito um, uh, to take the information from the original tribes map table to link the data in the table to the territories as mapped on the map. Um, and, then, and then we could display them in QGIS and that's what this map um, does. Uh, I forget which one, which piece of which piece of data this map is displaying. But basically the reason that we use these particular tools is that we were we're just using open source tools. So this is part of the Open Gulf project. Um, and this is particularly uh, the reason we did this is about access across multi-sided research teams and to create accessible and replicable workflows that can be taught to students and researchers uh, who don't have a lot of digital experience um, or who have limited skills with tech. Um, so a couple things about what these tools let us do. So on the one hand, they helped us to visualize geographical data and to link human data to spaces, which is something that um, is often difficult to do. I mean, obviously, as we've seen with some of the other projects, it's starting to be done, but there's not much of that. Um, it's, it's hard to do with online sources. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is a logical extension of kind of things that the Ottomans themselves are doing. This is a map of housing. So it's tents, uh, reed reed tents versus reed houses, basically. The dark is uh, reed houses and the, the light one is tents. And so one of the things that, that, this, that this helped us do is that it also showed us the limitations in Ottoman data production practices. Um, so this map in particular, you expect to see reed built dwellings in the south, but not in the north. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's something that we have not understood about what the Ottomans are doing. You can also see that the gray um, on the right-hand side of the map, that's where there's no data at all. So that in the tables, the data looks complete, but when you use digital tools to put it on a map, you can see points where it's wrong, where it's incomplete. We've, we've caught a bunch of different, kind, different kinds of mistakes as well. Um, 
And so this kind of let us see, uh, yeah, um, uh, let us think about Ottoman um, knowledge production and in contrast and kind of together with British knowledge production, um, possibly next slide. Um, and then I will just say really quick, yeah, so we can, these are other points where we saw where we could tell mistakes were so like where the population ratios of men to women were just like vastly Ill illogical. Um, and that you, you can see in the, the ones that are either white or dark red. Okay, so the challenges really quickly, um, two main challenges. One was working across institutions with different timelines, different obligations for researchers. Um, we have created, or Open Gulf in general has created shared communications infrastructure um, and has built a kind of workflow using these open source tools to work to enable work independent from institutional affiliations, but you know, there are still issues with it. Um, and then the second issue, a more kind of intellectual one, is thinking about how to get data, quote unquote, from sources and how to read the different sources together or against each other because they are all thinking about these categories in ways that don't necessarily um, aren't necessarily comparable or standard standardizable. Um, but you know, this is a productive challenge because it created new questions for us. And I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much. And like I said, questions can go to Nora. And the next, uh, whoever has not presented yet is, is next. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening from Istanbul. Uh, I'm Yurzat Kami. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, the Sabancı University in the Auto Legal Project. Uh, I'm representing a team uh, today, including myself, uh, Abdurrahman Açıl, Salih Günaydın, and Abdullah Karaarslan. Uh, these four people were invited to another WhatsApp meeting in October 2021 uh, and introduced an ongoing project entitled the Ulama Database. Uh, a two-hour record of that meeting is available on YouTube, so you can watch it. Our article in JOSA's special dossier is very related uh, to the subject of that meeting. Basically, we are sharing our experience uh, in building a database. Yet in the past one and a half year, uh, we got the chance to further develop the Ulama database and crystallize our thoughts about creating, expanding, combining, and utilizing biographical databases. So in several respects, uh, the present article contains new information and has a much more uh, mature approach to databases. Uh, which were naturally absent uh, in that previous WhatsApp meeting. So let me give uh, very, very briefly an overview of the article. It consists of five uh, parts. Uh, in the introduction, uh, we introduce our approach, which we call digital tabakat, by discussing its three principles, which are basically uh, to link every piece of information in a database to the source material it was extracted from, uh, to preserve native categories of information for each source, and finally, to have the ability uh, to reassemble the collected data under source independent project categories in a way that allow integration uh, with the linked open data resources. Uh, in the second section of the article, which is the longest part, we introduced the Ulama database project uh, that has been funded and hosted by the Center for Islamic Studies, also known as ISAM, in Istanbul since 2019. Yeah, we consider the Ulama database uh, as a good application of the digital tabakat approach. In this second section, uh, we discuss our data model, the main entities included in this model, uh, some significant attribute data fields for each entity, uh, source dependent and independent data categories, uh, so on and so forth. We also discuss lots of challenges we have faced while dealing with the biographical data in our sources. The third section of the article is designed uh, as an exemplary utilization of the Ulema database for research purposes. In this section, we provide some examples to how to use the filter options in uh, the web page of the database and extract data in the form of Excel sheets, and then how to analyze it through some software packages, such as UCI Net. Uh, the following section uh, discusses the future of our project. We mentioned some of the options before us to expand the database so as to cover people, written works, institutions, places, 
uh, from other time periods and geographies. And lastly, it comes to the epilogue. Uh, honestly, we were a little hesitant to re uh, either to remove or leave, leave this part because our final argument in this section is that uh, databases, including the Ulema database, are not fully able to replace human skill set and expertise of the conventional historians in terms of handling and analyzing historical data. And as you might notice, this argument at the first glance seems to contradict or at least undermine the whole undertaking we have been in for the last four years. Yet we have our convincing reasons to make such a claim. I will not dive into it now. I hope our explanations will convince the readers of our article as well. So good readings. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone and thank you for all of those presentations. Apologies that we are way off schedule. Um, I'm going to pass to Ali for one minute just to say something about how the Q&A is gonna work. And Baki has also um, put, a, put a note uh, about how we're gonna proceed. Uh, I don't need one minute actually, <laughs> but I think, yeah, the Q&A, we can discuss some uh, uh, conceptual problems or organizational problems or the problems that Ardam uh, somehow raises uh, about the place of the Ottoman digital uh, studies in the general landscape of dig digital uh, humanities and social sciences. Uh, for those uh, specific questions, uh, probably we can, you know, you can ask the uh, the the uh, authors separately, uh, but I think we we have very you know uh, limited time. But let's dedicate this time for like more a kind of a general uh, problems of the of the of the field, if you will. Um, I can also just say quickly. I already see some technical questions coming into the chat, and I think that's a very good place for technical questions or ask them. Um, send send emails to the presenters. Um, would also work very well for technical questions. So I'm gonna moderate, I'm just gonna go in the order of hands that I'm seeing. So Lale is is um, is first on my screen and then we'll proceed. Hi everyone, thank you so much um, for this. Um, I guess my question is, is like, I haven't had a chance to read the issue yet. And um, it's interesting to learn about the individual projects, but as someone who is like not doing digital humanities, the thing that I've struggled with for a very long time is like seeing people doing all of this and having no idea how to do it without developing a team and, and duplicating all of these efforts for like, so for people who are working with registers with large questions involving, you know, mobility space, all of these kinds of things, like what what do we do? Do you know what I mean? Like, I sort of feel like there are any number of different teams and projects like this right now. And yet I don't really have a sense of like how I can use this as a mid career, 40 something year old academic with limited, you know, like technical skills and without the kinds of resources that a lot of people who are part of this project, have. you know, like, so like what in terms of like, what's the big takeaway of like, how would I, how would I approach using a register with you know, the, these kinds of tools that exist already without having this type of a team and, and this kind of support? Like, is there a way to do that? Ali, shall we collect um, the questions that are here and then Probably, we can yeah, respond? If, yeah, and I mean, uh, Lali's question is to a general, uh, to the group, I suppose. Right, Lale. I mean, you don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think it's all really fascinating. I just right. like feel like for a really long time I've been listening to talks like this, and yet I don't have a sense of then how it's like, other than the sort of like plugging in an image or the crowdsourcing, which I, I thought is, I, you know, it's really cool, and like that's something that I can wrap my head around how I could use it, but I don't really understand otherwise how these tools can be used because also like you mentioned the problem of monetization there are so many of these kinds of things that have been lobbying so aggressively for universities to adapt them and they are really outside of the realm of possibility for public universities like like cuny right where there are very few ottomanists right so up and up to this point i still don't really have a sense of how digital humanities can actually benefit individual scholars who are working with just a tremendous amount of data so 
Can we pass to Amy and then Demetrios? And then that that is a big, extremely important question. Um, and then uh, respond. Um, so first of all, thank you to everyone. Um, it was exciting, gratifying, humbling um, to listen to all these presentations after um, the meetings that we had in, in 2015 and 2016, which weren't really a launch pad. They, in some senses, did what this volume has also done. And um, I want to push back a little bit on what Ali opened with to say that I think it's incredibly important to have the volume as a snapshot because it's a historical document. And for those of us who are historians, it marks a moment and it marks the difference between this moment and the one almost 10 years ago, um, where we did a fair amount of show and tell and talked about wishes, but we're in a different place now. And that I think then speaks almost directly to the point that Lala raised and um, a comment that I kind of scribbled down here, which is one question for us now as a field, I think is, at what point do we consciously bring into the academic professional formation of scholars of Ottoman studies in whatever um, dimension that is, at what point do we bring in an awareness and at least a kind of survey of technologies and potential results? Because I think that along with language training and along with um, sitting, you know, experience in research, we have to have at least a menu of possibilities in our minds about what are the technologies and techniques, what can they do, what would I need to use one of them, and how would I get started. In the meantime, my short answer to Lale is, I would take a look at the volume, find the people closest who are doing something closest to what you think you might want to do, and get in touch with them directly. The partnerships to build and this is what I learned the hard way, is in your own university, if you can find someone working computationally who would be interested in solving a computational problem that your work represents so that they get a CS article and you get a historian's article, so there's a win-win for both, that's one way of partnering. The other place to begin, and I think that Natalie Rothman has always really emphasized this, uh, is in our libraries, because our libraries are now the homes for many universities of the technologists and the people who know who at the university uh, can help you, can guide you, can point you in the right direction um, and, and what else you might need. So those are just some, some starting points for those. And um, the final, my final comment would be to Erdem Kabadaya's point or, or Cri de Coeur, about um, what we haven't done. Um, and that is, I think that what you're giving voice to in some sense is the extent to which Ottoman studies are still the realm of Ottoman studiers and that we haven't created perfect integrations with um, methodological or, um, or, or, um, or, or with methodological or different kinds of, of larger fields. And one way to break down the walls is that we tried to use in the um, charity and poverty workshop um, 23 years ago was to create meetings to which you invite the digital people with whom you want to be engaging and then structure the meeting so that they are commenting on the work being presented. And so that's a much smaller scale uh, way of starting to build the bridges out to the kinds of interlocutors that you, I think, are pointing to as necessary for us in, in, in our ambitions um, in the digital world. But bravo, everybody from, you know, Nuquette's initiative through everybody who contributed to put this volume out there. It is incredibly valuable. And thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, Demetrius, do you want to ask your question or make your comment and then we can um, perhaps yeah. elicit some responses? Yeah, of course. So my question is very simple one. Thanks so much for the volume and for all the presentations. My question is, how do we cite this data? 
And I know there is already a discussion about it, about professors, about the previous project. There is a huge amount of information there. And a lot of these results are searched through websites. The, not all of those things are through peer reviewed processes. So there are maps, there are charts, that they're in the website. And that's someone, all of you, they're like, that we have a lot of experienced people there in academia that you review articles, you review research. Is if someone is using those websites and those charts in order to support a claim or to provide background information, is this considered as reliable as a peer review article? If not, how do we address that? If yes, which of those websites can be trusted, quote unquote trusted? So I think this is one of the main issues that we need to address as we move on towards big data processing in our field. And uh, thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. I'm a PhD candidate in UC San Diego and I'm working on Greek Ottoman history. Thank you. Um, I think I just had a brief exchange with Baki about time. I think we're going to try to close the meeting in about 15 more minutes. Um, so what I don't see any more hands. So perhaps what we can do is just see who would like to respond to these very good and thank you very conceptual and very broad um, questions of the co editors and contributors. I have a couple of things I'd like to say and then we can either do that through hands or people can people can jump in perhaps doing it through hands is the most um, most efficient since there are still a lot of people on the call. Um, to Lale's question, I, um, Arvis, you know, uh, oh yeah, okay, we'll come back. To Lale's question, I think that one of the points Ali made in the very beginning about how we're all doing digital work at this point is really important to keep in mind, right? So any of us who are working in Google Sheets or any um, Google applications, I mean, to an extent, what we're doing with our word processors is um, is digital work. And so, thinking about sort of what level and what kinds of tools would be useful for you. And the answer might be not any that you're not already using, right? But I think Amy's suggestion about if, if any of this these presentations have been inspiring the tools and the kinds of analyses that people are doing, I think Amy's suggestions about starting in your own institution are great. Some people don't have institutions that are that have a lot of resources in this way. And then reaching out you know, to people who are here on this call or people in the field who have that institutional support, I would say is the way to go. One of the things that's been most exciting for me is shifting into a collaborative mode of research um, through this work, right? And, and, and really uh, working constantly with others uh, about research design. Um, on citability and accuracy, I think there's a number of things going into that question. Um, there's already a couple of comments about it in the chat. I would just say, you know, and this is, I guess, one response to Ardem's very important comment about, about process. This was a gigantic endeavor. It involves 25 research teams and over 50 contributors. Um, not everything went as planned, absolutely. Um, I would, especially the peer review process for the articles, uh, for all of the reasons that Baki mentioned. But I would say, you know, for those of us who know a lot about peer review, what is it that we're claiming about accuracy with peer review, right, is one question that I think we have to respond to that, um, that data, that data issue with, right. Um, and, and for those of us who are like creating, you know, with our article um, in the special issue from Open Golf, we also published a data set, the data set took probably as much or more time as the writing of the article. Um, and we tried to be very careful to include an extensive readme about what's in there and what's missing and what's not. So I think there are ways that we can do that um, responsibly and keep on discussing, but I would just push back a little bit on the idea that, that that is somehow quantitatively different from, or qualitatively different, excuse me, from the process of peer review. Um, Ali, do you wanna jump in? And I don't wanna, Marve has their hand up, so we can-, we can um, just, just a small comment about um, the website, how we can use the websites and also um, the peer review process. Um, I mean, I, I think that I look at, um, I'm somehow like, um, I understand Adam's frustration uh, and this is, um, you know, the Ottoman historians always complain that we, you know, uh, we have, as Amy said, 
uh, we there's a kind of reception problem and there's a kind of a this miscommunication or lack of communication between Ottoman history with other other fields and because of some peculiar issues uh tradition of the field whatnot but at the same time um you know the our material our sources are the field the history of the field is so interesting so rich and so multilingual so dizzying the complex it's not British history, right? I mean, it's not American history, and our material is not digitized at all. I mean, most of the material that we're working on, we are working on manuscript. Um, so we have the, our own challenges, our own problems, and we have to educate uh, other fields. It's not only just we learn from them. I mean, they should learn from us. So we have to have this, this self confidence. It's not easy, but it's not like I so that like somehow different approach than you know Adams. I mean, it's not just okay we. Uh, just, you know, asking for their kind of um, uh, involvement, of course we will ask, but it's a mutual issue, right? I mean, we know this, the fields, different fields have different problems. And, uh, you know, um, if you talk to the Chinese historians, you have the similar frustrations. Uh, so it's, it's a mutual thing. And I think we, it's an ongoing, on, ongoing process. And, uh, and, you know, as, as Amy said, I mean, we'll uh, create collaborations or um, communications in different projects sh should approach different, you know, uh, similar projects in different fields. And it is, it's, I don't know, we just started, but it's, I mean, the, the, the attitude that we have to have is, I think, uh, we have to educate uh, the other fields, not just we are educated. Um, so this is my approach. About the email, about the uh, sorry, the, the web pages. I mean, this is, I think, a very important question: how we cite it, how we trust these web pages, uh, websites, or different um, in different ways. I mean, there, there's some some web, you know, some projects are really like archives, right? I mean, these are the list of archives, or you know, you have to make searches and everything. So there's some tools, and then there's some other websites like ours, which is uh, a transparent uh, process. Um, I mean, we have a research issues, we have research questions, and we just somehow expose our research um, process to the people. It's not a, it's an ongoing thing. You, if you want to cite it, you can cite in a in a very careful way because it's an ongoing research. Uh, whenever we publish an article, peer-reviewed article, then it is really you know properly citable. Uh, I think uh, work. But I think there are ways of, you know, hybrid ways of citing and using this this material. Um, uh, yeah, I think these are my <laughs> comments. My friend, I and um, well, thank you everybody for these amazing questions. I wanted to sort of build off of Amy's and Ali's points about like what our field actually has to contribute. And what I realized, especially in like I'm doing research in computational linguistics and coding. And what I realized is a lot of these assumptions that like um that people in the field of natural language processing have about how language operates don't actually apply to a language like Ottoman Turkish it, because of its like morphological structure but also because of the ways in which we've been transcribing sources in the past like 70 80 years instead of like uh, transliterating and transcribing them instead of just like typing them out and like for example even something like lower casing in Python like a computer language does not work for the Turkish I and like E and uh, letters and our field really as it has the capacity to actually challenge some of these underlying assumptions that went into the making of of uh, computational linguistics as a field coming out of English and that is something that like we should emphasize and like think through a lot more because the particular challenges that we face also speak to um well are related in so many ways to the 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 new shifts in the modern day experience of AI based language technologies in our everyday life. And when we're having these conversations, I think we really should, they have a lot to learn from us. And that is something we should also be like emphasizing. But also we have a lot to learn from them, especially when it comes to sharing data and code and making data publicly available, which is also a legal issue. So like, you know, there are like, there are certain data sets I wanna make available. I don't know how that's going to work out, for example, with the Stanford repository. There's actually like a lawyer looking into this. So there are like different dynamics that go into, um, like, especially copyright dynamics and cross sort of like international copyright regulations that 
we should probably inform ourselves about a little bit more. Add that one. No. First, about the web pages, very briefly, just a reflection and the issues just Dimitrios and Mary has raised. Let's don't call them web pages first, if you ask me. But in any case, uh, there are other web pages. Bill has been introducing Senado to our field for uh, for ages. But all in all, I think we do not need to reinvent the wheel. So the data sharing principles have been around for a while. We, we don't do this as Ottomans, but you know, fair data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable reusable they are there to be honest and they're also peer reviewed in several cases i'm now and then reviewing data publications in data journals so there is an academic life out there i do not think that i've got that much to teach uh, in data science but i've got a lot to learn and in then this is i think important very briefly to ali's point i think we misunderstood each other so I didn't want to submit a research article to this uh, collection. I've thought that we don't have enough material for that. And I've told that if it's possible, can we give you an extensive research note, not an article? But then I think you told us that, hey, you know, it's better give us the research article. We said, all right, then let's write a research article. And I think we ended up with having three of those. And Ian Gregory, other experts that I had the chance to meet in person, thanks to Amy's organizations in Princeton, were there as a possible reviewers' names. That cannot work. It's fine. Bucky, you know, COVID, I've been also waiting for, you know, publications, reviewing things. This is the entire academia. But if it's all right, now we are talking a little bit. I think we lack a peer review, even, on, even among ourselves. So the fact that we didn't get much is a review from the editors is not that okay if you ask me Ali because for example we couldn't cite a work that you are working on you didn't give me a feedback about ours a feedback about your montology article we didn't have access to it and these things are coming out at the same time and to be honest again we didn't get that much of a review it doesn't have to be an expert in digital humanities an Ottoman historian I mean this is not only this this journal and this project, um, please don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to really be very negative in this, but recently, to be honest, we've got three publications as co-authored work, and we didn't get any reviews. One is published as a book it, from the Cambridge University Press. There, is, there are two more journal articles, and I don't think we are pushing ourselves much in the review process, and especially in a field such as digital Ottoman studies, the lack of that peer review mechanism is even, I think, more ineffective because this is the good opportunity to make progress in the new field. But like every people here saying, Lale and other colleagues, we don't know who's doing what. And the best way of doing it is going through a proper peer review process. Maybe I misrepresented the situation. And once more, I just wanted to highlight, this is my personal opinion, not the co-author's idea. This is what I think and feel. Lale? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Burchak might be ahead of me. Um, okay, sorry, Burchak. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I did. And I think, Lali, you just put it in the chat again, this whole issue of, so we're, you know, I think, you know, your question can be answered in two ways. And I think this is a, you know, a lot of um, similar questions uh, in terms of like, one is like, how do you have access to the projects that exist currently because you see them here and there and then you can't find them again the other one is which is a different question how can I produce a project myself like a digital project now these are different questions they are related in the sense that you don't want to create something that already exists so how do you how do you go back and see what's out there and this is not a I think this is definitely not an Ottoman digital studies question or a problem it exists across like all you know digital humanities projects globally. There are a lot of projects, and actually, like a lot of projects duplicate similar problems. They look at similar data sets, which is fine, but it's you know uh, it's about like not knowing that it exists is the problem here. And I I, not, I don't have an answer for it. 
except that you know like you know once you are interested in something you start searching but it would be great i think at least for instance if we could have a everything published in this issue for instance available uh with links not you know the the, the text is super important but also the, the links to the projects what they're doing so it's like it's a resource you know it's like it won't cover everything but it could cover the you know what what we have currently that is documented here also as a digital source so you can just click on it and go and see if that's kind of that's something you could use right and it may be that you know you you know fascinating projects here you could only have a, a, like a use of a very small portion of it but it's there so you don't have to redo it just that you don't have to write you don't have to go to primary sources every time you have a question you can go to the secondary source it's just it's the same same logic mm -hmm. um it is Ill now two and a half hours mark uh lala your hand was up Did, do you want to say something very short yeah i i guess i i would just love to see some part of the educational component of that built into a project like this because like ultimately you know i think it really also depends on where you're teaching and what you're you know like i don't to be able to like work on a huge project and then also go and reach out to people in my university and create those build those relationships and do all of this stuff to ultimately reproduce something that many people have already done like the tools for using like whatever the digital humanities tools are for working with diff DARs or like mapping mobility like spatial analysis like i'm sure many of you have already done that and i think that the conversation ends up being between either people who want to devote substantial time to digital humanities work specifically in terms of grants and university projects or people who are already doing it and i i don't see like a possibility like I, I still am just not clear then like on how how other people can can use this and I think that that would just be something that would be if if grants are applied to or whatever like some component of it for like rather than worrying about educating people outside of Ottoman history the Europeanists which is like a continual and very frustrating problem which I don't think that we is going to be ever resolved like it would be great to also think about how other Ottomanists can benefit from some of these tools so like it's not a critique at all like I mean this is you're all doing really groundbreaking stuff I guess it's just like the response to my question of like go to my university find a digital humanities person and like do this is like that's not something I have time to do with one person I don't have research assistants I don't have any of those kinds of things right so like um it, I would just love to like you know I could reach out to Gudhan and be like hey how did you do this with the registers right but like maybe some part of that like in terms of dissemination of information and knowledge could also be part of part of that could be envisioned as like a future stages of this type of project that that's kind of what I wanted to, to comment on thank you again to everyone um for all this fascinating work thank you thank you everybody Stefan Kurtz just put some uh note on there about where are all the projects question and what I was going to say was um what I can hear is that a place where everybody who does digital humanities in Ottoman studies would provide a little description of what they're doing and provide a link would be a good, very good thing. And maybe um, uh, the, there is Tyler Kin just sent digitalorientalist.com uh, another link. It, we already have, uh, there is already a website that Yunus shared digital Ottoman studies, and I imagine uh, digital Ottoman studies.com. Uh, probably, uh, if I'm Yunus, are you still here? Yunus, I is, Yunus is not here, she, he left. Oh, okay. I believe Yunus has some Marmara University funding or some center. I it, that kind of a place perhaps could be a place where one could have like a list of all projects going and everybody who does something could just put their thing on there so that there would be a go-to site uh, where uh, somebody is wondering what has been done digital Ottoman studies oh we can go there and look and then find it I was going to say OTSA could do this but I don't want to volunteer OTSA we are very short-staffed a, a university center that has already funding and some structure might be a better place to do this that sounds like something useful uh th that we could do um i because we are so so late i i'm gonna uh, sort of use uh 
you know, convener powers and uh, say thank you. Thank you to everybody, to uh, the contributors. There's so many contributors. This is a journal issue that had more contributors than any other journal issue, uh, the journal ever published. And the, the really, really hard work actually was done by somebody who's not here, David Goodman. Uh, he is the co-editor and the managing editor of the journal. And he was the one who actually put everything together uh, in terms of proofreading and this and that. And that was a, a whole a lot of work. And then again, I have to re-mention uh, Nuket Warluk. Uh, it was her vision, uh, really, uh, that brought this together because she started the ball rolling as a dossier. I think, I imagine she approached you, Ali, right? Uh, first. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, so Ali, thank you. Thank you so much for picking it up. And Nora, thank you so much for joining. Yunus, thank you so much for all the work you did already in Turkey. And then you brought that work here by connecting people, uh, bringing together. So I, I really, really, I think this is a great issue. I think it could be a milestone in the sense of, you know, here we are, you know, Ottoman studies doing all kinds of digital projects. Yes, we have many more miles to go, but uh, we are there. We are in the 21st century, for sure, I think. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so, so much for making time to join us. And you can watch the recording on YouTube. I'll be putting it up very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.